talking about reflexes. Uh, we're on part two of the newborn lecture, and we're look at the different reflexes that's common in a newborn. So we'll look at root, more rooting, sucking, and swallowing, and grasp. We're all, uh, sorry, I was expecting to have each of these explained. Okay, so I was apparently supposed to talk about those without pictures. The moral reflex, then, is called the startle reflex. And any time a loud noise, uh, or if you hit the bassinet, they will go into that startle reflex. And it's just a safety precaution. It, easiest way, rather than banging on the crib to see if they have a moral reflex, the easiest way is to lift up their heads and then let it drop down quickly. And you'll see it not drop them, but just you know, move your hand down quickly. And you will see them. They will make. Uh, they will have a kind of a, a grabbing motion with their arms and with their legs, and their hands will form C's. We would be concerned if they don't use all extremities for that. Rooting reflex is when you touch the cheek, and when you touch the cheek, the baby will turn toward that that touch. Anything that touches its mouth will cause it to root on it. So that's why you see it rooting on its T-shirt and everything else is there. Moms, when they're breastfeeding, will try to push the baby's face to the breast, and in doing so, elicit that rooting reflex, which makes them turn away from the breast. So you remember that when you're breastfeeding, you hold them by the back of their head. Sucking and swallowing, uh, these are important reflexes as far as nourishment, and they're, they're not really very coordinated in the beginning, but they should be able to suck and swallow. Grass reflex, anything that touches their hands will cause them to close their hands on it, and the same thing with their feet. They will have a grass reflex on their feet. So if you put your finger by their toes, their little toes will curl around your finger. That's the moral reflex you see in that bottom picture down there. You can see that the arms are out. You can see that the thumb and the forefinger are making a C. And you see that the legs are going as well. Tonic neck reflex. When you turn the baby's head to one side, you will see him assume the fencing position where he straightens out the other arm and turns toward the bent arm. Stepping or dancing reflex, if you touch his foot, either the bottom of the foot or the top of the foot, say hold him up, dangle him above the crib and just touch his foot, you will see him make a dancing movement or a crawling, uh, stepping movement. Babinski, when you stroke their foot upward, it causes them to fan their toes out. Now these reflexes, these reflexes are present at birth unless they've been drugged or unless they are neurologically not intact. But we also concern when some of these reflexes are, go beyond the newborn period. Okay, so that's always the thing that we would be evaluating. Looking at the transition that this baby is going to make, let's talk about the cardiac, the heart first. Remember that there's three fetal structures, the foramen ovale, the ductus arteriosus, and the ductus venosus. Those three you already know, you know what they connect, you know how the blood flows in the fetus. And the whole purpose of fetal blood circulation is to bypass the lungs, because the lungs are not working, and that the placenta is the main source of blood, or of oxygen, I should say. Here we see just a common picture of the fetal heart structure, just like in your book. Um, for the newborn, though, I'm going to back up again, sorry, but for the newborn, this is particularly important. As soon as the placenta is cut off, oxygen coming from the placenta is cut off, and so that's what causes that rapid shift in the blood flow. The lungs will open up, and that will pull blood in that direction. When that happens, the whole blood pattern is shifting from the lower part of the body to the upper part of the body. That means the ductus venosus is cut off immediately. It's gone. Now, it's still there, present, and if they do an arterial catheterization, they will go in through the umbilical cord and can go up through the pulmonary vein, um, sorry, the uh, umbilical vein, and bypass it up into the foramen valley, bypass it into the inferior vena cava by way of that ductus venosus. The foramen valley, is pretty much closed, it's open, it's sitting there, but because of the shift of blood coming more from the head than from the, from the base, it will cause that blood to flow downward instead of across, 
And so we see that with, with birth, with the loss of the placenta, majority of blood's coming in from the superior vena cava, which causes it to go right down from the right atrium to the right ventricle, instead of coming in from the inferior vena cava, which made it go right across. Okay, so the foraminal valley is there, but it's functionally closed. The duct, uh, ductus arteriosus, the one that connects the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein, is also there. It doesn't close as quickly, and but what we see is a shifting of the blood flow. Remember that before that, the the purpose of the ductus arteriosus was to bypass the lung. Now the lungs are open and will pull blood in that direction. So some of the blood will go through twice. That doesn't happen much, but if the baby gets into trouble, sometimes that ductus arteriosus will open back up and either give us persistent fetal circulation, which is not good, or will give us will be drawn off good blood going back to the lungs, which overcrowds the lungs. Either way can be a problem, and they will go in and tie off the ductus arteriosus if it doesn't close on its own. How long does it take for it to close on its own? Structurally, several, probably a couple of weeks, okay, but functionally pretty much shortly after birth. But we call that a patent ductus arteriosus. We see that in some babies, and that is a congenital uh, problem that we will have to have surgery to correct. Okay, looking at the lung system, you know, in utero, they, they practice breathing, and they have those pre-respiratory movements, so they would breathe for a while, then they'd rest for a while. So after birth, especially if they're immature, it's not uncommon for them to have apneic periods. Therefore, when we set up our monitors in the newborn period, the monitors allow for a 15-second apneic period. So remember, we talked about how they kind of chain stroke, and then their rest, and then their chain stroke, and then their rest. Normal breathing pattern. Those of the you that's been impeached saw that how difficult it is to count it because it's not regular like an adult's respirations. At birth, the lungs are filled with amniotic fluid. It is normal. As long as the amniotic fluid is not infected and doesn't have meconium in it, it presents no problem. As soon as they take a breath, air comes in, the amniotic fluid is absorbed. It takes an hour or so. So immediately after birth, when you listen, you're going to hear what respirations. But shortly thereafter, it will clear out. The concern is meconium aspiration. If the baby passes meconium in utero, meconium is that thick, greenish black, sticky stool that they have in the beginning. If it's in the amniotic fluid, it can get down into the lungs. We're very concerned about that. We try to do everything we can to not have him suck it in. So we want to make sure we clear the mouth and the nose very quickly at birth, just in case there's some amniotic fluid with meconium in there. Uh, if, the, if he's been meconium staying for some time, he may have meconium in his lungs, and these babies will have difficulty with respirations, and they will need, uh, they'll be in NICU for a period of time while we clear that out and get them back. Mm -hmm. Question? Side question, but I have a baby, and the baby was born with pneumonia. How does that happen when you're, like, how does it happen at birth? Like, or is it just... It, it was either an infected amniotic, or the question was, the baby was born with pneumonia. No, it doesn't happen. Either it was an infected amniotic fluid, if she'd been leaking for several days, that could be it, or it could be meconium, they just misunderstood the pneumonia, because meconium presents symptoms similar to pneumonia. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, if we have a baby, any baby, we need to be aware of the respiratory function. We're going to take their respirations, and if they're really struggling, you know what a normal newborn's respiratory rate is? What is it? 30 to 50, okay? If they're much above that, we need to worry this baby is struggling for respirations, and so we want to be careful that we're not taxing them more. So we're going to do a lot of things in that early period to reduce uh, his respiratory effort. First of all, minimize physical manipulation. If he's struggling, if he's grunting, grasping, really breathing fast, when we bring him into the uh, newborn nursery admitting room, we won't be doing a lot of handling. Let's let him rest for a little while. We can look him over, hands off, look at him, see how he's looking, his color. We can check his heart rate. But as far as making sure that there's no broken bones, that all can wait, okay, till he kind of gets his respiratory system going. Other thing to maintain respiration to, is to maintain a neutral temp. Neutral temp means normal temp. 
the baby was nice and warm in utero. He was born into this cold environment. He cool and he was wet. So evaporation quickly brought down his, his body temperature. So we are concerned about that. That's why we dry him quickly in the delivery room and we will place him under a warmer for our assessments and to really make sure he's stabilized. Warmers will help bring up his temperature. With under the warmer, we want to make sure his temperature under the warmer is not too much because that warmer is a, is a radiant heat warmer. And so it would just keep putting out heat. So we put a little thermostat on his body. Remember, we talked about that right over the liver so that it's going to regulate that thermostat so that it won't just keep putting out heat when his temperature is back up to what we want it to be. We, it'll slow down the amount of heat it's producing. If the baby gets too hot, and they're just like snakes, they take on the temperature of the environment. If they get too hot, what does that do to their oxygen consumption? It increases their oxygen consumption. Not good. If we're having respiratory difficulty and we got them hot, they're going to need more oxygen. That's not good. On the other hand, if they get cold, what do you do when you get cold? You shiver. You shiver. They can't shiver, but they will try to burn their brown fat to raise their temperature, and that takes energy as well, and they're using more oxygen. So the best thing we can do is keep them at a neutral temperature, steady, not up and down, not up and down. Semi Fowler's position, and why do we put them in the semi Fowler's position? How does it help respirations? What's the major muscle or respiration for the newborn? Diaphragm. Diaphragm. What happens when you lay flat? The intestines spread out and compress the diaphragm. When we put them in the semi-thalamus position, gravity pulls the intestines away from the diaphragm so they can expand better. We saw that yesterday and immediately got a rise of one or two points of, in his oxygen set. Didn't get where we wanted, but it got better. The other thing we're going to do is put him in a sniffing position, and that means raise his head just slightly like he's smelling something. Usually we'll put a little roll behind his shoulders. And the reason for that, we don't hyperextend their neck as you would for a CPR in an adult because they have more back head than we have. So we just put him in a slight sniffing position, and that shortens the airway. Blood, look at his blood system. In utero, he had a very high hemoglobin hematocrit. We've talked about that before. That's because he was getting secondary oxygen, low oxygen tension. Well, as soon as he's born, he starts breathing on his own. He no longer needs all those extra red blood cells. He's filling up his blood cells there. there he peaks up real quickly, and he doesn't need all those red blood cells, so he starts to break them down immediately. When you bre anybody breaks down red blood cells, one of the things that's released is bilirubin. The form of bilirubin that's released from broken down red blood cells is called indirect or unconjugated bilirubin. Indirect or unconjugated bilirubin. That bilirubin is fat soluble. Indirect, unconjugated. It cannot be easily excreted from the body in that form. So it travels to the liver <coughs> where the liver conjugates it and changes it to conjugated bilirubin or direct bilirubin. What was the un unconjugated bilirubin? Unconjugated is fat soluble. It's also called indirect. Conjugated bilirubin is water soluble and it's also called direct. Think about this. Indirect cannot go directly out of the body. Direct can go directly out of the body. So once you convert it in the liver, it will uh, be excreted through the urine and taken care of. Yes? You said it's broken down red blood cells. Is that what you When red blood cells are broken down, bilirubin is released. Okay, the liver is going to conjugate it. The liver is lazy. Think of lazy liver. And in most newborns, it doesn't get active for about three days. So it's kind of just sitting there waiting. Uh, too early, not going to worry about today. And so we see that rise in bilirubin, of unconjugated bilirubin in the body, and that's what gives the baby that yellow appearance. Usually with most babies, we see at birth their normal color, then their color kind of gets, and it's really almost a tanned appearance. You're going to look at the baby and you think, well, he looks pretty good. 
One of my babies was very jaundiced. We called him Yellowbird. He was jaundiced for, for so long. And I'd take him in for his daily blood bilirubins, and you'd always have somebody say, oh, your baby has such pretty color. You know, most babies are pasty white. And I'm thinking, give me pasty white. I am tired of this jaundiced baby. And that is very typical. They look pretty good. The way that you can tell that they're jaundiced is do blanching color. Push over a bone. And when you re release your finger, look at the color underneath that, and it will be yellow. And then it will turn back to the color he is. If you, um, I'm sorry, it'll be white, and then turn back to that yellow color. If Billy Rubin builds up, starts in the nose, goes to the face, and goes down the body. So the buildup of Billy Rubin starts there. That's a typical thing. So at birth, they're kind of pasty white, but by three days, they have that nice kind of golden tan. Then the liver starts conjugating, and their Billy Rubin goes down. So everything's just fine. That is normal physiologic jaundice, icterus neonatorum. Jaundice, newborn jaundice. Babies get it. No matter what color they are, babies will get it. The problem is unconjugated bilirubin is fat soluble. That means that's why it goes to the skin. It goes to the skin, that's fatty tissue. But another place that's fatty is the lining of the brain. And so that bilirubin will gather at the lining of the brain and prevent nutrition, oxygen and nutrients to get into the brain. And that is the problem with elevated bilirubin levels. It's called kernicterus. Icterus means jaundice. Kernicterus is a problem. I'm gonna go back to that previous slide because we're not ready to talk about that. So this is our problem with bilirubin. It is more common in babies who are sick. If a baby gets sick, the lazy liver gets even lazier. It says, you want me to conjugate when we have all this other stuff going on? If the baby gets cold, you want me to conjugate when I'm cold? Uh-uh. Liver is very lazy. So anything that causes problems causes that liver to be lazier. But the other issue you have is anything that causes red blood cells to be broken down more rapidly will also cause more bilirubin problems. So if you have a baby that's got a hematoma, if you've got a baby who was bruised and mangled coming out, those are red blood cells that's no longer in circulation, they're gonna be broken down. So any of these things would increase the bilirubin. Yes? What did you call the words? Kernicterus. Can you spell that? K-E-R-N-I-C-T-E-R-U-S. Kernicterus. Okay. We'll talk more about bilirubin later on, but going to the system of elimination, it is normal for babies to void in utero. They actually add volume to the amniotic fluid, and that's part of the exchange of the amniotic fluid. The amniotic fluid is not static. It is constantly changing. It, it's constantly in, uh, changing, and that's why we can do amniocentesis and determine how the baby's doing, because it's constantly being changed. It's constantly being changed because he swallows it, and then he pees into it. So in addition to mother producing it, we have these other sources. The baby who doesn't swallow, there's a problem with that exchange, and so this baby would develop, well, the mother will have polyhydramnios if the baby cannot swallow because his brain is not functioning or because he has an upper GI obstruction. If he's not peeing, if he has a kidney problem and he's not peeing, the mother will have oligohydramnios. So these are prenatal clues that something might be wrong with our baby. It is unusual for babies to pass meconium in utero. That means that the baby's under stress. When we see meconium, we worry about the baby, we worry about meconium aspiration. It also tells us that the baby's been in distress of some sort. It, the baby could come out being meconium stained and have a greenish stain to the skin. And that means that's been going on for some time. He's been under stress for some time. Placenta wasn't working, he wasn't getting the oxygen he needed, whatever was going on. It could be you see clumps of meconium, which means probably during the delivery process, he got under a little bit of stress and evacuated his bowels. So it does tell us that we have to worry about this baby. Temperature regulation, we've talked about how he cannot really do a good job. We must regulate it for him. Code stress. 
Cold stress is a condition you must understand. It means he is burning his brown fat to try to produce heat. This causes him to affect his glucose metabolism and a baby who gets cold will become hypoglycemic. So we put them under the warmer and warm them up, but they won't eat because they're hypoglycemic and lethargic. So the best thing is not to let them get cold, but recognize if they get cold, we've got to get some sugar into them pretty quickly. Okay, so we've talked about the systems now, now we're going to talk about newborn care. At birth, we're going to do eye, uh, eye prophylaxis. It's required by law in all states. Most parents are not terribly aware of it. You know, we have all the all-natural mothers who don't want any shots or anything on their baby. They want to be all-natural. Why anybody would want to be all-natural and get all the bugs in the world coming at you, I don't know. But they're not really aware of the eye prophylaxis, so that they don't give us a problem with that. Uh -huh. Has a baby where? In the woods, like outside. No. Good for her. <laughs> you know, and that's great if everything's okay. And if every, if they're talking about they're talking about a new show coming out where the mother has the baby in the woods. You know, if everything works out fine, gee, it was a great experience. But if everything doesn't work out fine, what are you going to do? It, you may be 30 minutes or an hour away from the hospital. In the meantime, that baby is suffering or being damaged, and then you get to the hospital, and who's going to want to take care of this woman who didn't do what she was supposed to do in the first place? Because it goes against their stats. And the next thing you know, the baby's born damaged, and they want to sue the doctor. Oh, well, you know, have your baby in the woods and sue the woods. That's just the way it is. So we do antimicrobial uh, eye treatment. Uh, we used to use silver nitrate. Uh, it stains the eyes, so most times they use penicillin or erythromycin, something like that, an antibiotic. Prevents ophthalmia neonatorum, which is blindness due to gonorrhea. As the baby comes through the birth canal, if the mother has active gonorrhea, picks up the organisms, you don't really see it. And you don't see it in looking at the baby, but then it, it develops a real gunky eye and will cause blindness. So it's preventable blindness. So we treat every baby for it, even if, you know, we test the mothers and we watch for any symptoms, but in case we miss it, in case it's a very early on disease. You can delay your uh, antimicrobial treatment for up to one hour, and we recommend that you delay it because of bonding. Remember, the eye-to-eye -eye contact is so important. The baby needs to look back at mama in order for mama to bond well to the baby. Uh, and the antimicrobials often cause chemical conjunctivitis. Uh, the eyes get red and irritated and burn a little bit. They may want to keep their eyes shut, maybe a little bit <coughs> swollen. But that's, it's a temporary problem. Yes? Um, if a mother has gonorrhea, why would she be taking that to birth? Why not? Because of the, um, Easily treated with antimicrobial. So why would you put it through a vaginal? And vaginal, you open up the uterus, you spread that organism everywhere. You're asking for more trouble. This is the eye uh, prophylaxis. Make sure you know how to put on eye drops or eye ointment. Main thing here, that's not a really good picture. You've got gloves on because the baby hadn't had his bath yet. It, you're going to go, you're going to make a little cup of the lower lid and put it in that little cup. But make sure you're not pointing the tube point to the eye. If the baby jumps, so you, it's, it's done parallel, not perpendicular to the eye. Okay, give them a fat, uh, we give them a vitamin K injection. Uh, most, most physicians order this. Vitamin K is a fat soluble vitamin, A, D, E, and K. K uh, is necessary for blood clotting. Newborn's diet is not a good source of vitamin K because it doesn't contain much fats. In addition, we have bacteria in our, in our guts that will produce vitamin K. The baby's sterile at birth, and so he doesn't have that source. So we give him that supplement of vitamin K to prevent prothrombin deficiencies. You give it in the vastus lateralis, make sure you know how to find the vastus lateralis. It's that muscle in the middle of the thigh, and it's sticking kind of straight up at you, and you're giving it off to the side so that you're going not in toward the bone, but back straight down that muscle. So check that you know how to do that. That would be a, 
I don't like this picture. I'm not wild about this picture. It's just hard to find. And you can do it that way. Uh, I usually do it from the top. It's easier to lay them flat and do it from the top and just go on the side there. Oh, what's that on the baby's back? Mongolian spot. Does he look black? No. He looks Oriental, Asian. Okay. So here's our picture of the, of the uh, leg. Here is in this dark pink area is the area you want to give it to. Uh, there is a nerve that runs right behind the bone. So that's why I don't like to lay them on the side because if you're a little bit further back, you're going to hit that nerve. If you're coming in from the front, there's no way you can get to the nerve because it's behind the bone. I'm going to do cord care. This could be made of triple dye or alcohol. It helps to dry the cord and to disinfect it. You always start from the most open end, go to the most closed end. So immediately after birth, you start at the cut edge and go down to the base. After that, the cut edge is dried off, so you start at the base and work up. Always take off the cord clamp before the baby goes home. Cord will not fall off for about seven to 10 days, and it won't heal completely for two weeks. It is not unusual for a drop of blood to come out. When the cord falls off, mama's panic, call the doctor, and it's just a normal finding. Shouldn't, if it stays wet, then that is a concern. The baby came in yesterday, that was five days old. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't have any dye. It had alcohol. Oh, it did? Mm -hmm. okay. so it was dry. Yeah, yeah. it'll fall off. Okay. Mm -hmm. Even if we dig nothing, it falls off. How did you say the pain? Is it from? The most open to the most closed. And the most open is near the Immediately after birth, it's at the cut in. And then after that, that, it's at the base okay. coming up. Yes? I took care of a baby one time, and I thought he just had a really large alley. But I was asking my grandmother, and she thought it was a penis somewhere. Because she said it had a large alley. And then she said it had a large alley. The question is can they get a hematoma from cord care? Never seen it. Mm -hmm. Never seen it. I think it's probably an Audi. Okay. Or it could be a hernia. Okay. Uh, feeding, if it's a bottle-fed baby, the first thing we give them is D5W. Uh, the concern is if there's something going on and they get the what they drink into their lungs, this would be very hard on them. Milk is much harder than sterile water, so we would the best thing to give them might be sterile water, but that provides no nutrients, so we give them D5W, which is kind of in between. Uh, then after that, they will go into formula. Formula is fed at room temperature. The only reason we heat formula is because we store it in the refrigerator if it's made. If you're making up one bottle at a time, you don't need the hot water, just room temperature is fine. Bottle-fed babies are fed every three to four hours. The formula that we prov provide them uh, tends to stay in the stomach, has larger curds, and so it's harder for them to digest, so it stays better. Breast milk, on the other hand, is very easily digest, and the stomach usually empties in two to three hours, so we feed them more often. Breastfed baby, the first thing they get is colostrum. Uh, milk comes in on about the third day, and after the milk is in and let down is, and engorgement is kind of gone past, let down's occurring, the baby empties the breast in five minutes. Doesn't take long at all. They will nurse every two to three hours. How do you know the baby's getting enough to eat? The big thing that you should know, put a big star by this, and hopefully from the last test you learned, if I said put a star by it, it will show up again. Some of you didn't learn that last time because there was a question that was related, and I know it said put a star by it, and you missed it. So six to eight wet diapers a day. I'm going to count them. And it's not wet diapers. It's wet diapers, little bitty spots because they don't pee much of the time. The way he's changing that diaper is not acceptable. Okay, don't do that because you can dislocate the hips that way. So you're going to pick him up by his butt and slide the diaper under. Don't lift, his legs are not lift devices. It's how everybody does wrong. Don't do it. Even like when they're a little older? Yes, even later. Yeah, I didn't know that. And now you've got to go teach that. Okay, now you've got to go teach that. What? When you open a diaper and it's dirty, how do you? Your hands can be washed. 
those hips that's dislocated will be a long time problem. So, don't worry. Okay. We're going to switch over now. And I don't think I've posted this one, so I'll have to post this one after class. And it's high risk. Talking about some of the problems we're going to see. And we're just going to quickly go through this. We're not, not going to concentrate a lot on this one. Uh, you'll get more later on. It's okay, it's still recording. I wasn't sure it was still recording, so we'll just go right into this one. Uh, talk about a little bit of the high risk. The problems that we see in the newborn are the immature or overmature baby at birth, premature, preterm, or postmature, postterm. Also, the small for gestational age, large for gestational age baby, the infant of a diabetic mother. Uh, premature, preterm. Babies born before 37 weeks are considered premature or preterm. Uh, incidence in the United States is about 12.7%, so a significant number of our babies will be born preterm. African American babies are uh, more likely to be born preterm than non African American. And preterm prematurity accounts for about two thirds of infant deaths, so it's a significant finding. Things that can happen to a preterm baby, they will have respiratory uh, problems because their lungs are not mature. They are even less likely to be able to regulate their temperatures. They require a very high amount of nutrition and don't have very good ability to acquire nutrition. Their immune system, they missed out on all the passive antibodies from mother because they were born before they were passed out. And the kidneys are immature and cannot regulate the body like a more mature baby. Supposed to be, he's supposed to be a parasite at this point. He's supposed to be letting mama take care of all this mm. stuff. What causes the respiratory difficulties? Well, first of all, babies are born with inadequate surfactant. New preterm babies have inadequate surfactant. Surfactant is a lipoprotein produced by the alveoli of the lung. Surfactant decreases surface tension in the lung. Two wet surfaces sitting together want to stick together. Washing dishes, you've got a glass inside a glass and you pull them out of the water and you try to separate them, you can't. That's surface tension. If we could put surfactant between those glasses, they'd come apart easily. That's what we're talking about here. We have two wet surfaces of the lungs sitting like this. When they open it, if they have inadequate surfactant, in the beginning, they, they have a little bit because they have been building it up for a while, so they have a little bit. But they aren't able to keep up with the production so the longer they live, the harder it gets to blow up lungs. Okay? So they start having respiratory difficulty. Think about think about um, a balloon. When you first get that balloon, is it easy to inflate it? No, that's a lung without surfactant. Okay? So that is a major problem. Um, it makes more effort to get air in and eventually the baby will tire out and will stop breathing on us. In addition, his lungs are smaller, he has less number of functional alveoli and he has a smaller airway, easier for it to get stopped up. The airway is typically the size of their little finger. Well, you look at your little finger, not very big, but think about those babies' little fingers, how big they are. So it's easily obstructed. Their muscles are weaker, and their bone structure is not as supportive. They also have a more immature brain. All of this is adding to his respiratory problems. So we see increasing respiratory distress. He may breathe fine at birth, and then as the days pass, he gets into more and more trouble. He develops atelectasis, and that's collapsed areas of the lung, and hypoxia. He develops respiratory and metabolic acidosis, and his kidneys are not able to compensate for him. And then he will have apneic periods. Again, he will be in that preterm that I'm supposed to be in the uterus mode still, where I'm going to breathe and practice breathing for a while, and then I'm going to forget about it. Well, that's not good enough. You can't forget about breathing because you're out here now. And so sometimes you'll see a baby that's in an isolate, 
and they'll have his hand in a sling. And when he goes apneic, the apneic alarm goes off. They just go in and jiggle the hand. Wake up, wake up. He wakes up, starts breathing again. Okay? So you will see that sometimes. What are the symptoms of respiratory distress? And this goes for just about everybody of pediatrics. Retractions. Retractions are when the, the bones cave in, especially under the rib cage, sometimes over the rib cage, and sometimes between the ribs. The, that's because the, the bones are not very strong. This, you all don't have retractions. By the time you're maybe six years old, you won't see retractions very often because the bones are stronger. Nasal flaring, when their nares flare out to try to get more air in. Expiratory grunt, and the little baby that came in yesterday was doing some grunting right at the beginning, which is a very soft mm, mm, mm. That's purposely closing the glottis to keep pressure in the lungs because they don't do a very good job of keeping pressure in the lungs. When they breathe out, they breathe everything out, which lets the lungs collapse again, and it's like starting that balloon all over again. So gl the grunt helps keep air in the lungs. Seesaw respirations, when their chest and their belly go in opposition. Cyanosis, unoxygenated, he unoxygenated hemoglobin. You may, you may see tachycardia or bradycardia, and you'll see apnea. Yes? Uh, is, there common Is it ratio different? No, it's just higher because they're not blowing off carbon dioxide. What can we do for them? First of all, we're going to minimize their oxygen requirements. We're going to stress them as little as possible. We're not going to be handling them a lot. We're <coughs> going to leave them in their bed, keep them in a neutral temperature. Uh, keep the noise level down, just keep everything, as make them do as little as possible. We're going to provide them oxygen. When we give oxygen, we give it as warmed oxygen and humidified. But we want a good, we often have to have a really high concentration of oxygen. <coughs> Excuse me. If we tried to get a higher concentration of oxygen in this room, normal oxygen concentration in the air is 22%. How high could we get here in this room? 22%. All the spaces let out air. So the bigger the space is, the, the lower you can get the concentration. Sometimes we'll put them in an isolate and just have oxygen blown in that whole isolate. And that's better than a whole room. But it's still not as good as this little box that you see over his head. It's called a Billy's box or um, an oxy hood. And this fits over his, or a doghouse. And it fits over his head there's a hole for his neck and you want to make sure you get one that fits him well so that the hole that's around his neck is not too big not too big a hole because air escapes that way and notice we're blowing our oxygen directly in there he does not need oxygen on his feet he only needs oxygen in what he's breathing in and so that's why we use an oxy hood this will allow us to get higher concentrations of oxygen into his blood that's good as long as the lungs are immature but we must keep monitoring his blood oxygen levels. We monitor the, the oxygen level in that hood, but we also have to monitor his blood oxygen levels on a regular basis because as his lungs mature, he better, he's better able to absorb the oxygen, utilize the oxygen, and so he will get his higher and higher oxygen level. In your body, oxygen is a poison. Too much is not good, okay? Too much is not good. And so carbon dioxide is what makes you breathe. If we blow off too much carbon dioxide, you stop breathing because the brain doesn't get the message to breathe. So we have to be careful that we don't get too high a level in his blood to <coughs> cause problems with breathing. It also will cause a spasm in the back of the eyes. It will cause the blood vessels to spasm in the back of the eye and will lead to blindness. We'll talk more about that in a minute. He may be on continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP. And that is a way to maintain pressure in the lungs so he cannot collapse the lungs totally. And instead of him having to do that grunt, we make a machine do it for him to keep him from blowing out. So he will, it will breathe in for him. It may let him do it on his own. But when he starts to breathe out, it will only let him breathe out so far. And then it kicks in and says, breathe in again. Okay. He may have an intubation to make air 
getting air into his lungs easier and he may be on a ventilator and we call him a baby bird baby bird ventilator a respirator okay if his oxygen levels get real high in his blood then this will cause a a respir uh, a, a visual problem called retrolental fibroplasia retro means behind lentil the lens fibro scar tissue plasia growth the growth of scar tissue behind the lens so what happens is it causes a spasm in the blood vessel that feeds the retina that spasm causes blood to leak out and pushes the nerve away from the from the eye until it completely separates once the nerve separates from the retina that is permanent blindness it's a preventable form of blindness when we first were salvaging these babies that were born very immature most of them got retrolental fibroplasia but as we learn more we are pretty much able to prevent it now by monitoring their oxygen blood oxygen levels not the outside oxygen levels but the blood oxygen levels and decrease in oxygen being fed to them as your blood oxygen levels arises if they're on a positive pressure respirator another problem that that causes a ventilator most of our ventilators are positive pressure that means it pushes air in and allows the air to come out pushes air in and allows that's a positive pressure respirator <coughs> this causes a toughening of the lungs a toughening of the lungs uh, it loses its elasticity and leads to a problem called bronchopulmonary dysplasia it just means that the lungs are tougher they don't uh, they don't allow the transport of oxygen across from the lungs into the blood as well and they don't give they don't stretch as well we'll talk more about bronco bronchopulmonary dysplasia but it's a continuing problem for babies who are very who are born very very premature that are on respirators especially if they got oxygen and respirators so they are left with a chronic lung so you have a choice of a baby that survives but has a chronic lung problem versus a baby who dies because we don't do that well a better option is a is a negative pressure uh, respirator the old-fashioned polio iron lung type thing actually pulled the lungs open from the outside and that actually doesn't do as much damage to the lungs but it's kind of hard on these itsy bitsies iron lung uh, they've got some versions of it for babies yeah typically we don't use it because the positive pressure works better so how would that work would it be like this about them? no it's just on the outside it's the the pressures on the outside of the chest causing the chest to come out which opens their lungs and then it closes so it's so just mm -hmm. just a lot when if something pulls your lung, your chest out that causes your lungs to open when your lungs open it sucks in air so that's how the old iron line worked yes uh-huh pressure on the outside and then the positive is pressure on the Mm -hmm. okay when we are worried about a baby we're going to monitor their respiration we're going to put them on an apnea monitor some of you have seen those apnea monitors typically will measure um, typically it may measure uh, heart rate may or may not measure heart rate it may or may not measure measure oxygen saturations depending on whether we got it hooked up or not but it also it primarily will monitor them not breathing remember it'll have that 15 second delay so it won't be keep alarming with every cycle we also can do transcutaneous oxygen sat monitor what you all are doing is just a little temporary oxygen sat but we can actually put a device on the skin that's measuring through the skin uh, these have to be moved because they use heat and so it can cause some damage and of course we can do arterial blood gases and that means we draw arterial blood we don't the physician will draw arterial blood and send it to the lab to measure their blood gases medications that we might use we might use sodium bicarb because they cannot their kidneys are immature and cannot modify their pH so we can do it for them by giving them sodium bicarb modifies their pH for them the other 
drug that may be used as surfactant replacement therapy. We, are, we have come to the point now that if the baby is not producing enough surfactant, and remember it's a continuous production, you're actually producing it right now. Harry just produced it. What'd you do? You yawned, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Yawned. Whenever you yawn, you're increasing your, ox your, uh, your uh, surfactant. Okay, so we're constantly producing surfactant. With the baby, the immature baby, doesn't produce enough as fast, and so we can give them as endotracheal, so a physician will administer into their lungs, and you will see that done sometimes. Thermo yes? So, like if you know a baby's going to be born early, what is it that they give them? We'll talk about that later. That's, that's going to come. Okay, thermoregulation difficulties. Baby has very limited ability to produce heat. They have decreased gly glycogen stores in the liver, which is what we use to burn, to produce heat. And also the immature baby, the premature baby, will have less brown fat. And brown fat is what the baby uses to burn for energy. In addition, they have a greater ratio of body surface to weight. Think about your body surface to your weight as compared to a baby who weighs 2.1. Who was at? Who was in the high risk? Laura, what did he weigh at birth? Um, he weighed 1.63 kilograms. 1.63 kilograms, which is less than, it was maybe two, it's almost three pounds. We, okay. But look at his body surface compared to his weight. So he's going to have a lot more surface to lose heat through. In addition, his head is large, and that's a major loss of heat through his head. He has very little subcutaneous fat. Some of us have more than others. But that becomes our insulator. Have you ever wondered why people who are overweight often complain about how hot it is when everybody else in the room is comfortable? They have more insulation. Their skin is... <laughs> Chris tells us he's complaining all the time. Uh, the skin is thinner, okay? And it's more permeable, so easier to lose heat through it. Yes? So brown fat is, you said, a way for them to uh, burn energy. But is it also an insulator? Yes, but it's only located in certain areas, and they don't have much of it at all. How can we maintain their temperature? We're going to dry them immediately after, at birth, and then we're going to, cover them up. We put them in an overbed warmer. The other thing we're going to do is put, it looks like bubble wrap. We actually have some little blankets kind of made of bubble wrap. And it actually, we only want this part of their body showing, they're open to it because we want to keep the heat in. You can see that this baby looks like he's in a little plastic bag. And that's to help prevent evaporation of heat. So yes. Mm -hmm. Keep his head covered. Put them in a pre-warmed warmers. Those of you that's been in the OB, been in the nursery, they have warmers on at all times. Because if a, ba if a woman comes in popping out, we got to get that baby into a warmer as quickly as possible. We don't have time to warm it up. And we use the servo controls to maintain his heat. And that's what you see there on his belly. Encourage kangaroo care in the delivery room. Uh, encourage kangaroo care and that's putting the baby inside mother's clothing so that the baby is skin to skin and helps maintain but <coughs> mother's heat will maintain the baby's temperature risk of hypothermia of low body temperature include hypoglycemia we've already talked about that respiratory distress takes more oxygen therefore he's more likely to go into respiratory stress apnea and death a cold baby is a dead baby Nutritional issues for this preterm. He has no stores. He didn't wait around to build up stores. So he needs it given to him continu continuously. He has a very small stomach. He has either a weak or no suck. And he's so uncoordinated he can't suck and swallow at the same time. So getting food in is a problem. His GI tract is very immature and not able to absorb nutrients. It wasn't supposed to be out doing it now. And yet he needs more calories than a full-term. Needs more calories per ounce than a full-term baby does. 
So he has a lot of problems. Things that we can do, that we're going to give him total parental nutrition. The IVs that we've been taking care of are D5W, D5 normal saline, sometimes even lactated ringers, but these are all just sugar water with other nutrients in it, but there are with other electrolytes in it. There's no other nutrients. You cannot maintain your weight on sugar water, and you definitely cannot gain weight on sugar water. You need protein. You need fats. And so we can place this baby on total parental nutrition. Parental means not by the GI tract. So we're not giving it by GI tract. We're giving it by IV, TPN. And we can meet his full needs this way. It will include glucose, amino acids, that's proteins in a very, very immature, very, very broken down way, fats and electrolytes. It is strong. It will stress the liver. Babies who are on TPN often develop a pseudo-diabetes. In other words, the sugar content of the solution is so high that his pancreas cannot handle it. So we often are administering regular insulin with the TPN so that he can handle the sugar. He also would develop kind of a hyperbilirubinemia. A um, little bit different in that his skin color will be more of a green color, okay? And uh, it stays that way for a longer time because of the stress of the liver. Is yes, green, green. army. So It really means more conjugated. It's both, but more conjugated. More con mm. Yeah. Another thing we can do is gavage feeding because his sucking and swallowing is immature, and because it takes a lot of energy to suck and swallow, we can bypass the system. We can put an NG tube down and feed him directly into the stomach. Uh, TPN works, and if they're very, very small, we're going to go with TPN until he's a little bit bigger. Then we may use a combination. <coughs> we know that by giving foods by the GI tract, it's going to help the immune system. If we put you all totally on TPN, your immune system would be depressed. So no matter what, we try to give something by GI. So we do gavage feedings. Yes? How do you know when the bellies are strong enough to get the It's based on weight. We do it based on their weight. Okay, when they reach a certain weight. And it varies from hospital to hospital what the weight has to be. Okay. The best thing we could give him would be breast milk. And we can actually add to the breast milk to make it stronger, to make it more concentrated, okay? That's why we encourage mothers who give uh, birth to preterm to breastfeed to pump their breast. The baby can't nurse. It's much harder to breastfeed than it is to bottle feed, okay, for the baby. So we have them pump, and we store their milk, and then when the baby is mature enough to take milk or colostrum, we will use mother's breast milk. In the old days, we used to have breast uh, milk banks where mothers would donate their extra breast milk and we'd use it on other babies. But now that's blood and body fluids, so we don't do it anymore. But babies who receive breast milk, even partially, part of their feedings is breast milk, uh, will have a reduced risk of necrotizing enteral colitis, which we talk about in PEDS, NEC. When we are feeding by good vodge feeding, we typically will give him a pacifier at the same time because the baby needs to learn that he's, when he sucks, his stomach fills up. If we just gavage feed him no pacifier, he tends to think that it just comes on. You know, it's just great. And so he always, will, he will continue to have problems once he gets even bigger sucking because he doesn't recognize that's how he fills up his stomach. So we're kind of training his brain to recognize that sucking equals food. Uh, formula feeds, uh, we'll use a value feed. I've showed it to those that's been to peds because the bottles that come from the manufacturer are not accurate. We put them in a value feed that we can measure the amount of feeding milliliter by milliliter. So we know exactly how much this baby has. The doctor will order an exact amount and that's how much he gives as, he, as we give him. As he matures, we, he may be on bottle feeding, and maybe the doctor says 23 milliliters every two hours. And we attempt a bottle feeding, at 20 minutes, he has had 18 milliliters. Well, 20 minutes is probably is all we need to feed. If you go over 20 minutes, this goes for everybody. If you go over 20 minutes on a feeding, you're burning more calories than you're getting in. So we stop the 
bottle feeding, and we put the rest down in the garage. So he gets his 23 milliliters, he just didn't suck it off. Preemie nipples have kind of gone out of fish fashion. I don't know. Have y'all seen red nipples down in high-risk nursery? We don't keep them on the floor anymore. They have decided that they are problematic. I'm not quite sure why. Here's a discussion of necrotizing endocolitis. We t- may talk about it again. Uh, it's a problem with the GI tract. And the problem is that bacteria are getting into the walls of the GI tract. Necrotizing means dying, killing, and so the GI tract is actually going to die from this bacteria that get in there. Uh, what causes this to happen, we have discovered it's very likely in our preterm babies. It's also very likely in our full-term babies who are stressed at birth and have hypoxic periods. And so we recognize that it's related to the hypoxia. When somebody is hypoxic, you have that diving reflex where blood is shunted from the GI tract to the vital tissues in the body, right? Y'all knew that already. When that happens, it allows the GI tract of the immature baby, it allows the bacteria that might be in there to get into the wall. And so that's our issue. So it's related often to immaturity, but also to hypoxic periods. Leads to ischemia of the tissues and death of the intestines. One of the symptoms of it is that there will be air in the wall of the GI tract. So when they x-ray the baby, they will see this air in the GI wall. Leads to intestinal rupture, which would lead to peritonitis and death. Was, S- what? Was that only when they in the x-ray? Could you tell it like No. Well, they will have increasing distension, and they will be absorbing less and less of the food. No matter how you give it to them, they're absorbing less and less because their GI tract is shutting down on you. So we watch them. We, we make sure if we're doing NG feedings, we always check residual. How much is left after our last feeding? Two hours later, we're feeding again. We aspirate to see how much we get. We put down 23 and we got 18 back. Not good. Okay? It means he hasn't absorbed that much. Also, we measure abdominal circumference on a regular basis, once a day, twice a day maybe even three times a day, and you would see an increasing abdominal distension. Okay? So if somebody at the baby house is to We don't do anything. The physician will make that decision. But at that point, he's going to have to have surgery. Okay? You've heard of babies who have short bowel syndrome. This is what the cause of short bowel syndrome is. They had to go in and remove enough of the intestines that he doesn't have enough intestines left to... Uh, Quick, quick, quick. <laughs> okay. We've talked about the hyperbilirubinemia related to TPN. All premature babies, though, have an immature liver. They are stressed out. So all babies will have a problem with hyperbilirubinemia. They will all have a problem with indirect bilirubin. We will treat, I've almost never seen a preterm baby that we didn't treat for uh, hyperbilirubinemia. Talk more about that later. Okay. Let's take a break. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's talk about the post mature now. <laughs> no, I'm not up here. <coughs> okay, post mature. This is the baby who goes beyond 32 weeks of gestation. And although that would seem like, well, that, you know, should be better than ever, it's not always a good thing. Uh, the biggest problem we have is that as the, the placenta was designed to last 30 weeks, not 31 weeks, not 32 weeks, not, you know, and so the longer they stay in utero, the less benefit they're going to get from their placenta. So they're going to be uh, actually going downhill after about that time. When we see the baby who's post-mature, they often are wrinkled. Uh, they've lost fat. 
they have a kind of a wizened expression to their face. They seem to be more alert um, and looking around and open, but their skin is very dry, maybe cracking. Uh, may have some meconium staining because uh, they've been telling us that they were in distress. What are the risks? Fetal hypoxia, not enough oxygen, meconium aspiration syndrome, hypoglycemia. They used up their stores before they even were even born, so they're more at risk for it. Then we have the baby who might be small for gestational age. Okay, so that means that his he may be term, he may be preterm, he may be postterm, but he's not within the normal range. And this depending on how severe it is, may be called an intrauterine growth retardate, IUGR, intrauterine growth retardate. Uh, we also see babies who are born large for gestational age. They're bigger than we expect them to be. Uh, this is not good either. Uh, they have a lot more fat stores. They've been, they've been exposed to a lot more sugar. And that's not healthy either. To be exposed to a lot of sugar floating around doesn't help them. And so not only will the macrosomic baby have problems maybe with delivery, he's 12 pounds, 30, you've heard of a 16 pound newborn, try to look, deliver that thing vaginally. And it's kind of hard on him. And he's not in great shape for that reason. So um, the, the mark macrosomic. Is the large for gestational Large for gestational age, fat, okay? Extra growth, large growth is what macrosomia means. Infant of a diabetic mother, uh, is a special baby that creates a lot of problems in the nursery. Mother was diabetic, diabetic, either during pregnancy, so she was a gestational diabetic, or she's always been a diabetic or been a diabetic for a long time. Either one is a problem. The baby, the fetus of this mother, has more issues than a normal baby. If the mother was poorly controlled, it could mean excessive glucose in the circulation. If the mother has has high blood sugars and she's not taking her insulin, she's not following her diet, lots of sugars floating around, which causes a fat baby, but fat babies are not good babies, and it actually slows maturation. So even if that baby was term, he wouldn't act like a term baby. Um, it also can lead to problems with the placenta, that, that fatty buildup uh, in the placenta blood vessels, which decrease oxygen supply to the baby. So a baby born to a poorly controlled mother may be fat or may be an intrauterine growth retardant. Could be either extreme. In addition, the babies do not mature as well they're at greater risk for respiratory distress syndrome after birth. If even a full-term baby born to a diabetic mother may have respiratory distress syndrome. We'll talk more about respiratory distress syndrome in pe pediatrics, but it occurs in prematures, infants di uh, of diabetic mothers, and infants born by C-section. Three classifications that have an increased risk of respiratory distress syndrome. With an infant of a diabetic mother, right there, they've got number one. In addition, the placenta doesn't always last the full, y'all read, read what I read, 40 weeks, thank you. That 32 week is wrong, it's supposed to be 42 weeks is post mature. Um, um, Why don't y'all ask sorry. me that? 42 weeks is a post mature, I'm going, uh, that don't seem right. So yeah, <laughs> okay. So, but the placenta doesn't last a, last a full 40 weeks in the diabetic woman. And so many times they will electively uh, deliver her at 36 to 37 weeks because we, if we let her go to term, many times the baby's born dead. It was fine, all of a sudden now it's dead. So they often will deliver her prematurely. So now we have an infant of a diabetic mother born prematurely. In addition, cervix may not be ready so it may not respond or the baby may be big, so they may decide to do a C-section, and so we can be hitting all of the categories and say you're at risk for respiratory distress. The liver, again, everything's immature. So the liver's more immature, so therefore he's this baby's gonna have more problems with hyperbilirubinemia. 
In addition, if he's a big baby, he may be bruised and mangled, which means there's more of a problem there too. Thermoregulation. So we have this baby who weighs 16 pounds and acts like a two pounder. Can't keep his temperature up. He's just very, very immature. Okay, so even though he's got lots of subcutane, subcutaneous tissue, a lot of fat there, he doesn't hold his temperature at all either. So he's just gonna act like a very, very immature baby. And again, as I mentioned, Babies born to diabetic mothers have a much higher risk of dying from nothing than, than normal babies. Infant of a diabetic mother at birth, large babies can have birth injuries, hypoglycemia. They have been used to lots of sugar coming through, okay? And so all of a sudden that sugar's cut off because the placenta's cut off, mother's no longer supplying sugar, but their little pancreas is saying, I'm producing insulin like crazy. And so they're producing insulin, but the sugar's cut off. And so they will become hypoglycemic at birth. It's a major problem with them, hypoglycemia. Yes? This might be a stupid question, but if the mother's blood sugar's high and she gets insulin, will that affect the baby's insulin? It will cross the placenta, but he still produces his own. Matter of fact, he may produce some and help her out some. So it doesn't affect his blood sugar though? When she it helps, it helps her, his blood sugar because it decreases the amount of sugar that's floating around. But it's not going to drop his below? The, no, okay. no, no. Not a problem. We also, I mean, if she became hypoglycemic, he would too. Okay. Because he's, she, she's in charge of everything. Thermoregulation is a problem. We've already mentioned that. Respiratory distress is a problem. We've mentioned that. Hyperbilirubinemia is a problem. So this baby's got lots of problems at birth. Babies born to diabetic mothers tend to have greater risk at birth. Okay, I was expecting more. <laughs> Questions? Let's see. This, oh. It will be on Canvas. <laughs>